What is going on, New York Giant fans? Welcome back to another video on the Big Blue in the Bronx YouTube channel. Hit the like button, comment, and subscribe. Turn on post notifications so you know when a live stream pops or video drops. Appreciate you coming back. Share this out. Five stars on Apple Podcasts. Use the Seeky code $20 off your entire order with the promo code Big Blue in the Bronx. Um, also, Patreon $2.99. We got some articles coming out on there, we got some exclusive videos early access to videos, behind the scenes, all that good stuff. We need more members on there. Please, Patreon, it's in the description. Go sign up for it. And also, we thank uh, the members of the Transparent Ones here on YouTube. Even though we're not doing as many things as we were last year on the member side, um, you know, Joe Gian Petro, Jets West Mess, all you guys that are subbed up to the Transparent Ones as a part of the members program, we appreciate you guys. So, I made a short earlier today on the resigning of Wink Martindale, and we're going to get into it here on a bigger scale, which I wanted to do. And this video is going to be entitled, Is Wink's Resignation a Bad Reflection on Head Coach Brian Dable? So let's talk about defensive stats the last few years. We'll get into the pro bowlers and improved players, edge production, questions, and selling point. So defensive stats. Let's go to 2022, then 2023. 25th in total yards, 14th against the pass, 27th against the run, and 19th in points per game. Now, compare that to 2023, where the Giants arguably were worse in all categories. 26th in total yards, excuse me, 26th in points per game, 29th against the run, 19th against the pass, and 27th in total yards per game. Now you look at the blitz percentage and all that analytical stuff. First in blitz percentage, second in blitz percentage this year, first last year, sixth in pressure percentage in 2022, 21st in 2023, 29th in sacks in 23, which isn't a good thing. Obviously, they struggled a lot this season to get sacks against the Cowboys, against Buffalo, some of these other teams. As far as turnover, turnover differential goes, that's where the Giants actually improved. They were second in 23 and 11th in 22. They were 32nd in interceptions in 22 and bumped up to 7th in 23. And as far as forced fumbles go, they were in the same spot, third. So positives, you could say that the Giants were better in the turnover category, which is always a good thing. The run defense, that's something that needs to be improved with the next defensive coordinator, and that needed to be improved uh, for a couple of years now. Patrick Graham didn't solve it. Wink Martindale didn't solve it. It's been an ongoing thing the last few years. As far as pass defense goes, I don't think the Giants were actually that bad. Uh, if you're a guy that just looks at stats, you got to look at the film and game scenario too. Also in points per game as well, because whenever a pick six happens or a special teams touchdown happens, that actually is a reflection on the defense, uh, for instance, the return touchdown by Noah Igbenogany in week one, the pick six in week one and week four by Daniel Jones, those were a direct reflection on the defense. So that's where you have to take it with a grain of salt. So moving forward, let's go to the pro bowlers and improved players. Let's start out with Dexter Lawrence. Dexter Lawrence didn't have a single pro bowl recognition before 2022 and 23. The talk Going into 22 was, okay, he, is he going to improve? Is he not going to improve? Um, you know, what's the story with him? Are we going to let him go in free agency? The defensive tackle thing, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so 2019, solid rookie season. 2020, good season, four sacks, and also a regression in 2021 under the Graham scheme because they were playing him on the edge. They were not playing him on the interior. They were playing him on the edge, and they were also playing him on the edge in 2020 because A, lack of edge rushers, and B, also they had Dalvin Tomlinson in 2020 and had many rotations to go through. So, again, 2022, what's the story with Dexter Lawrence? Between him, Andre Patterson, and Wink Martindale, Dexter Lawrence is one of the best defensive tackles in in the National Football League and has grown to be that. Seven and a half sacks in 22, 28 quarterback hits, uh, seven TFLs, 68 tackles, quarterback pressures, 36. In 2023, though not as high in sacks and quarterback hits, he was still disruptive and also was hampered by a hamstring injury. Four and a half sacks, seven TFLs, 21 quarterback hits, and 23 quarterback pressures. So, boom. Back-to-back -back years where Dexter Lawrence is a pro bowler. Bobby Okereke, who is one of the top guys in Pro Bowl voting, but didn't make it. Now, people were talking to me in chats. 
Oh, Bobby Okereke, yeah, he was good before Wink. He was solid before Wink. He is elite now. In the years prior. And also, let's say this, right? Indianapolis Colts, I know they were going in a different direction, all these other different things. Why didn't they want to re-sign him? I'm, I don't know if they picked up the fifth-year option on him. Or maybe he was a second-round pick or something like that. I don't know. But anyway, as far as Okereke goes, I mean, he wasn't even a Mike. He wasn't even a Mike before 22. It was Shaq Leonard and then Zaire Franklin shared that role with him. So you go to 2023, career high, second career high in tackles, a career high in tackles for a loss, career high in quarterback hits, career high in sacks, about tied in interceptions because he had two in 2021. And also as far as quarterback pressures go, highest in his career. And decent coverage stats, not great, but decent. So, you're telling me, oh yeah, he, he would have been this great under any defensive coordinator? That's a crock of shit. Uh, Xavier McKinney. Good coverage stats the last two years under Wink Martindale compared to Patrick Graham. Gave up one touchdown each last year and then this year. One and a half sacks. A career high in tackles at 116. You have to admire that. Three interceptions, which is the most since 2021. Uh, two tackles for a loss, a quarterback hit, half a sack, a forced fumble, 11 pass deflections, which is a high. Now, guaranteed, the first part of the season, he was bitching and moaning, and he was actually playing a little bit bad uh, about his contract and all that other different stuff. But the second half of the season, he was actually pretty good um, with the two interceptions off of Marcus Mariota. I forget who he had the other interception off of, but I have to give credit where credit is due. The next guy is Kayvon Thibodeau. I'm not going to give too many details about him because I want to go into a separate subject, subject uh, when it comes to the edge position because it's, it's it has its own like, doings, you know. Uh, but 16 QB hits, 12 TFLs, 50 tackles, 11 and a half sacks, which is more than double he had in his rookie year. He had one fumble recovery, more forced fumbles, more quarterback hits, more TFLs, more quarterback pressures at 33. And also is a Pro Bowl alternate. I think he's third-ranked Pro Bowl alternate. Uh, Isaiah Simmons. When I say that Wink Martindale was the only defensive coordinator to get the best out of Isaiah Simmons, I think it's true, right? The stats don't pop out at you. One sack, interception, which was a pick six, 50 tackles, uh, sack, if I didn't mention that already, quarterback hit, two TFLs, and three quarterback pressures. But if you look at the film, first of all, he had a very good coverage year. If you look at the film, his impact on third down, just being a decoy and a blitzer and not in coverage and a tackler, you look at the film, you notice the impact right away. You notice the impact that he had. Sure, he had a couple of bad plays here and there in zone coverage, but he was very good on third down thanks to Wink Martindale and the linebacker coach. Another guy that's very good because of the linebacker coach, uh, minus the missed tackles, Micah McFadden. Also, again, credit to Wink Martindale. This guy, we didn't know what to expect in 22. 23 comes along with a better linebacker next to him in Bobby Okereke. Triple the quarterback hits, double the TFLs, almost double the tackles at 101. One sack, four fumble recoveries, five pass deflections, an interception, and also eight pressures, 22 missed tackles. He needs to clean that up. Also, not a bad year in coverage. Better coverage stats than last year. One interception, one touchdown allowed. 86.6 uh, passer rating, 78.8 completion percentage. So those are the improved players. Whether you argue it's position coaches, this, and the other thing, they're still under Wink Martindale. Edge production. Let's talk about that. Also, how about we credit another guy? Let's pull up his stats. I mean, we could go into Nick McLeod, but I'll go into Jason Pinnock. Now, he's not a pro bowler, but... Again, a guy that was very good this year. I think he ended the best year of his career. Uh, sad it ended on a uh, season-ending injury note. But four quarterback hits, six TFLs, 85 tackles, two sacks, an interception returned for a touchdown, another interception against Green Bay, two forced fumbles, six pass deflections, and seven quarterback pressures, two touchdowns allowed in coverage, and also a career-low passer rating at 74.8, 54.8 completion percentage, lowest of his career. Another guy to add to the list. But anyway, let's go to edge production. Why do I include edge production? Well, because his best friend, Drew Wilkins, got fired, which led to Wink's resignation. Now, there are some reports out there that there was a big roo ha uh, that, you know, Wink yelled, fuck you. I'm not going to go into that because I don't even know if that report is true. But it pisses me the hell off that Dable says in the morning, yeah, we expect Wink to come back 
I think he purposely fired Drew Wilkins, not because the the room seemed like it was underperforming, but he knew that Drew Wilkins was Wink's best friend. He fired him because he wanted him out, and then boom, Wink follows him out. Pisses me off, personally. But let's go to Edge Production, right? Thibodeau, Pro Bowl art alternate, we read the stats. Now, why do I bring him up in Edge Production first? Obviously, most production, number one. Number two, if you guys... Have seen the tweet by Brett Coleman. I'll pull it up on the screen. If not, I'll leave a link to it in the description. If you guys read that tweet, it will tell you how Kayvon Thibodeau got 11 and a half sacks this year. Some just straight up beating tackles. Some with free rushers and him getting to the quarterback, clean up sacks. And also some against backup offensive tackles. So, let me ask you this. In any other system, does he get 11 and a half sacks? The answer is no. Obviously, you look at Matt Judon, you look at Kalias Campbell, all these different guys, they didn't get double-digit sacks in Wink's system. I get that. Trust me. I saw that even coming into when Wink was hired as defensive coordinator. As far as Thibodeau goes, that's the outlier. Because when he's hand in dirt, and he's, when he's always against the, D, the, uh, the offensive tackle, and he's not put in any exotic blitz situations, he's not getting 11 and a half sacks. I fucking promise you that. And a lot of people who would want to say otherwise, debate me in the comments section. Aziz Ojolari, you can argue that's coaching, which can fall on Wink, Andrew Wilkins. You could also argue that he is not on the field consistently. Seven QB hits, 16 tackles, three TFLs, two and a half sacks, a fumble recovery, 11 games, and 14 quarterback pressures. That you could argue is coaching and him not being on the field. Jihad Ward, I'm not here to make chicken salad out of chicken shit with Jihad Ward. He is a role player. But let's say this. Under Wink the last two years, he's had career highs in quarterback pressures, sacks this year, TFLs, and quarterback hits. Again, role player that plays primarily against the run, but the last two years under Wink, this guy has been better in his career. I'm not saying he's an all-star, but just a point to be made. Also, again, a reflection on coaching, but... He did absolutely nothing in Buffalo, did absolutely nothing here, was also inactive for a portion of games. That's Boogie Basham. No quarterback pressures at all, no impact versus the running game, no tackles for loss, 11 tackles total. So, in my opinion, that was just uh, Brian Dable and Joe Shane trying to get their guy from Buffalo and trying to see if it worked and throwing shit at the wall. Um, I don't think he's going to be on the team next season, maybe as a depth edge rusher. And also, that's another thing, a knock on Joe Shane. The Giants didn't get serious when it came to backup edge rusher, knowing that Aziz was injury prone. But again, I digress. Questions. Is Brian Dable hard to work with? Cam Brown and Carter Coughlin have already said on social media that they won't be returning to the Giants. Now, they didn't outright say that, but you could see their farewell posts on Twitter and Instagram. There was that report a few weeks ago. By that one guy, I don't know his name, and then there's Jay Glazer who had the report before him about this feud. And then that other guy, I made a video on it actually a few weeks back. He was saying, you know, Brian Dable is an absolute dick to work with in the building. Well, this raises the question. That report that I'm not going to say because I don't know if it's true about Drew Wilkins and all that other stuff that's on Twitter. I don't know what account posted it. But if that is true, Brian Dable must be an asshole to work with. And if that's the case, and he wants to put his ego above Wink Martindale, because Wink Martindale, I mean, we could argue, yeah, Brian Dable won Coach of the Year, but Wink Martindale, more successful defensive coordinator, and more successful at his position than Brian Dable was at OC, because he had two good years at OC. Other than that, garbage offenses. Miami, Browns, other offenses across the league. The Chiefs didn't have success until his second or third year in Buffalo. Let's just put it that way. And also, scheme difference, right? How many of these players are actually going to be good in the next scheme? Kayvon Thibodeau, you're relying on him to be more one-on-one -on -one in matchups against offensive tackles. Jason Pinnock, is he going to be in the box as much? Micah McFadden, how much is he going to be utilized? Let me tell you something, folks. It's not a guarantee that this defense, whoever you hire, is going to be an absolute hit next year, which goes into the selling point. This has to do with the Giants selecting a quarterback. Think of it as a marketer. Think of it as someone who is a fan, like myself, and wants to go to Giant games. I want a return on my investment. I want something to watch. I want to go to the Giants game and have something to watch. Obviously, 
Middle of the season, things can change. If the Giants don't select a quarterback, what is your selling point? You can't sell the defense again because it's only a hypothetical. The defense has been good the last two years. Not elite, but good under Wink Mondale. He's gotten the most out of them, right? Mike Kafka's offense. What do we have to fucking sit here and hope that he can get the most out of Daniel Jones? Now, if they say, okay, Daniel Jones is going to be the starter. We're going to get a rookie in here and start him in week eight, week nine. Okay, then you're selling me on a vision. But if you're going to sit here and sell me on run it back with Daniel Jones and hope the defense is good enough and try to push for a playoff spot, you should be fucking fired. Because I get it. They had the coach of the year, the playoff run in 22, all these different things. But New York Giant fans are tired of no direction. They're tired of losing. They're tired of mediocrity. The last thing we want to turn into is the fucking New York Jets who don't have a direction, who have one guy controlling the fucking franchise, like a bunch of marionettes and all that other shit, like puppetry, okay? The New York Giants need a sense of direction next year. You select a rookie quarterback, fine. I said this on a live stream. I'll say this here and we'll end it off. I will give the New York Giants till the end of April to sell me on a direction and a defensive coordinator and defensive players basically until the af- until after the draft and I will make my decision then because if they don't select a quarterback then you have no vision you have no direction and you should be fucking fired call me irrational call me emotional don't care debate me in the comments section like comment subscribe folks turn on post notifications so you know when a live stream pops to your drops appreciate you coming back we're going to talk about the staff changes a little bit more I mean not necessarily the wink stuff Maybe a little bit, but we're going to talk about the uh, Thomas McGahee stuff. We're going to talk about the Bobby Johnson stuff on the podcast, which will be out 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time Tuesday afternoon. Um, And also, we'll talk about the Giants-Eagles game, some things to learn, all that other good stuff. But uh, appreciate you guys. Again, join the Patreon, $2.99 a month. Talk to you soon.